I'm Joanne Lilly, Director of Content Programming at CEDA. Welcome to CEDA's live stream today, The Future of Mental Health Support and Services, where we're joined by leading mental health decision makers and advocates to discuss developing a holistic approach to support and services. Before we start today, CEDA acknowledges that today and every day, we are on Aboriginal land. In my case today here in Melbourne, that's the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. CEDA pays respects to elders past, present and emerging, supports their stated aspirations and is committed to recognition and reconciliation. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge NAUS Group for their support of today's event on behalf of CEDA and Tim Money, Chief Economist at NAUS Group, will be our facilitator for today's discussion. A little housekeeping before we start. CEDA's program in the second half of the year will continue to offer a diverse array of discussion forums, both face-to-face -face and virtual, to allow people from all corners of the country to participate and to inform and promote debate of critical issues. To keep abreast of the range of events and discussions on the most important issues impacting Australia's economic and social development, we encourage you to visit CEDA's website www.ceda.com.au, where you can also register for our upcoming events and watch recordings of past live streams. Via the website, you can also access our range of podcasts, video interviews, and blogs with leading experts and policymakers mm. to ensure you remain up to date with quality information on key issues impacting Australia's economic and social development. Today, as at all CEDA events, you'll be able to interact with speakers through our Q&A portal, which is available via the link below the video on your screen. Or you can enter the details by going to cedar.pigeonhole.at and using the passcode FUTUREHEALTH, all one word, all capital letters. Post your own questions and vote on questions of others there. You can also join the conversation or invite others to join on Twitter by using today's hashtag, which is hashtag mental health, and tagging CEDA at CEDA underscore news. Now, turning our attention, to, our attention to today's discussion, one in five or approximately 20% of Australians aged 16 to 85 experience a mental illness in any year. During their lives, almost half of all Australian adults will face mental ill health. Couple that with a year like 2020 that brought Australia devastating bushfires, torrential floods, and a global pandemic, and it's perhaps not surprising that Australia's mental health services are under increasing strain and scrutiny. With us today here at CEDA, we have an esteemed range of experts to talk about the future of mental health support and services in Australia. I'll hand over now to Tim Marnie, Chief Economist at NAUS Group, who's, who's facilitating the discussion for us today. Tim. Thank you, Joanne, uh, and welcome everyone. Can I start also by reiterating the acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the lands that we are spread across, across the nation today, uh, and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging, and all Aboriginal persons and Torres Strait Islander persons present on the, uh, the link up today. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you. Um, and to uh, facilitate this discussion, which um, is incredibly important. We have uh, a mental health system that is uh, universally accepted as being highly complex. Uh, there are many services out there, but there are not enough services. And the services that are out there, there's a distinct lack of integration between them, which means the pathway for individuals in uh, maintaining their mental health and addressing uh, issues of mental illness can be difficult to navigate uh, and find their way. So we have a service system that's in need of a pretty major overhaul. Um, and we have three speakers today with us who uh, have not only um, incredibly well-informed views on these issues, but also in positions of significant influence to actually change the future direction of Australia's mental health system. So I would like to introduce uh, Lucinda Brogdon, AM, Chair of the National Mental Health Commission. Welcome, Lucinda. Thanks, Tim. And also Professor Alan Fells, AO, Professional Fellow, University of Melbourne, uh, and Patron of Mental Health Victoria. G'day, Alan. Hi, Tim, thanks. And then lastly, Jason Trithowan, 
uh, CEO of Headspace. Welcome, Jason. G'day, Tim. With those introductions, let's get stuck right into it. Uh, we have a complex topic and I'm sure we could talk all afternoon, but I'm going to ask each of the speakers to take firstly five minutes uh, and then we will roll through the three uh, and then we will go to your questions and ideally uh, have a very highly interactive discussion for the remainder of the time. So if I could please ask you, Lucy, to kick off with uh, your five minute overview. Over to you. Thanks, Tim. And thank you to, to everybody online today. I understand it's over 400 people, which is just fantastic. And it's not surprising because this is such a significant topic. I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and particularly acknowledge the deep understanding that our First Nations people have and bring to us when it comes to social and emotional wellbeing. The, the more I work in this space, the more I truly believe it is from them that we have so much to learn and, and appreciate. I'd also like to acknowledge those of us with a lived experience of mental ill health here today and those that love and care for someone on that journey. It's not easy, but I think it's um, one that I hope you can travel with a sense of support and strength. And to also just remind people that we are talking about mental ill health and suicide, and for some this might be a distressing topic, and to really just bring to your own minds the, the self-care strategies that might help you as we discuss this topic today. And why is CEDA discussing a topic like this? Why is it so significant? Well, the Productivity Commission's data shows us that mental ill health and suicide cost our economy around $200 billion a year. That's with a B. That's a significant number. And the Productivity Commission said, and we've said it on many occasions, that not all of this cost is avoidable, but a significant proportion of the cost is avoidable. Mental illness is inherently preventable and treatable for the vast majority of people. And so it's a real opportunity for Australia to think about how we tackle these issues collectively and then what we might do with that money if we could invest it elsewhere. The National Mental Health Commission is an executive agency in the Department of Health and we monitor and report on the national system, essentially the Commonwealth services and system, and we provide, we like to think we're a catalyst for change, really informing good policy design and outcome work. And what we know is that mental health is not well understood in the community. We do continually see issues of stigma and discrimination, whether that's in our workplaces, in our communities, in our academic institutions, wherever there's a touch point to life, we see that stigma and discrimination still. And that, that's a really troubling issue for us. We also see and experience the issues around affordability and access that Tim touched on, and we understand that the system is hard to navigate. There are nine governments across Australia that all like to touch on mental health service delivery and policy, and that can be a real challenge for us. Some of the issues that we're working on, the National Mental Health Commission particularly, are around the Vision 2030, looking at how we particularly tackle that missing middle of the system. The Commonwealth services generally look at primary health care, our GPs, services, for example. The states tackle the other end of the spectrum at the tertiary level. But as many people have talked about for a long time, the middle is missing. And how do we build that community mental health service and the adjacent services that need to support that in the social determinants? We do our national reports. We've been very engaged in the pandemic response plan that I'll talk to a little bit more. We've been engaged in developing the National Disaster Mental Health and Wellbeing Framework, again, something that Joe touched on. We're about to launch the first ever National Children's Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy for Australia. We've got the National Mental Health Research Strategy coming, the National Workplace Initiative, and something that uh, I'm particularly proud of is and it's up and running now, is the Suicide and Self-Harm Monitoring Project that, um, Tim, you may recall, three years ago we were at Parliament House, no one could agree on sharing data around suicide and self-harm. And now working with the AOHW, we've got a resource that's really coming to the fore, providing as close to real time as we get and improving all the time. And most recently, a project that's come off the back of the Productivity Commission is the National Stigma Reduction Strategy, which is going to be led by Dr Michelle Blanchard. And this is not about 
public service announcements. This is really looking at the, the structural stigma and discrimination we see right across our system, whether it's in insurance products, banking and finance, the justice system, or other elements of the community. It's something that's important that we tackle. Joe did ask me to touch a little bit on the COVID impact around mental health, and I will do that. And, and I think it's important to think about what COVID's done in the context of mental health. And Nicholas Proctor, a, a great colleague from South Australia, said that the virus uses its invisibility to really exploit naturally occurring pathways through which humans interact with each other, our ability to be physically connected. And I think we've all experienced that. And so it's been a real challenge for all of us to look after the wellbeing of people across Australia. The Mental Health Commission went from thinking about the one in five Australians that Joe talked about to the five in five. Data from the ABS, from the ANU, from Melbourne Uni, all the big population studies really talked to us about the increased levels of anxiety and depression in our community. But we do know that it's our young people, our elderly and women that were most adversely impacted by, by COVID. Around 20% of people are saying that their mental health is still only fair at this stage. But on the plus side, a quarter of us have started to spend more time thinking about our mental health and wellbeing and proactively doing things to improve that. So I think there's a, a plus in that one. But it's been a challenge to provide the social, the economic and health supports for the population. And while we've been doing that through the National Pandemic Response Plan, we've also had other big reform agendas that, that other speakers will talk about today. And the Productivity Commission is really probably the biggest of those pieces of work as it tackles the national issues. And its recommendations focus on early intervention and prevention. They focus on ensuring that people actually have access to the right services when and where they need them and that they're affordable. It's about improving people's experience of the system when they're there. Too often we still hear people talking about poor experience and experiences of stigma and discrimination from within the health system, and so that needs some real work. It's about building the workforce, and we've got real challenges right across the workforce from our clinicians, the academics, the social workers, the peer workers and lived experience all being engaged in that system. And it's about building what the productivity a commission called an evaluation culture in what we're doing, focusing on good outcomes and really trying to work to those outcomes. In the context of the workplace, just briefly, because I know many of you are coming from that place, the National Mental Health Commission with the Mentally Work Healthy Workplace Alliance has developed some resources to really help workplaces bring people back to site. One of the challenges that we've seen and people have talked about in the context of the last year is bringing people to and from site and keeping connected. But one of the pluses is the great work that Super Friends produced to show that people have now felt in 2020 more connected to their employer and workplace than they have in the past seven years. So it doesn't have to be a physical presence. Some assertive outreach can work wonders. We are doing more around mentally healthy workplaces and the National Workplace Initiative is looking at ways to protect, to respond and to promote good mental health and wellbeing. The majority of us spend most of our waking lives at work. So I'll finish up there and allow others to speak and really look forward to the discussion and debate that might follow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy, uh, for those comments and observations and, I guess, challenges as well. Um, let's build on that with Professor Alan Fells. Over to you, Alan. Thanks, Tim, and I congratulate CEDA on uh, having this event because mental health raises important economic as well as social issues. I too acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and also people with lived experience of mental health problems. So what's to be done? We need to recognise that we do have a blueprint for reform right now. We have the Productivity Commission report. Uh, we have the Victorian Royal Commission on Mental Health and then other important reports, suicide prevention, the work of the National Mental Health Commission and so on. So the challenge is to make it happen. 
And that involves making governments make a high priority, much higher than in the past, of mental health reform. Requires government prioritisation, business also in the workplace needs to prioritise, our society needs to do so. And I also want to mention the health system itself. Within it, mental health needs to be a higher priority, not at the bottom of the pile. And in making it a priority, uh, we need to involve all parts of government, and I'd particularly emphasise the importance of having the central agencies, premiers and prime ministers departments, the treasury and finance departments, and so on, supporting and enabling the reform and recognising that actually the economic benefits alone from mental health reform dwarf the economic benefits that you would get from most other microeconomic reforms that are being talked about. And we need to ensure somehow that the prioritisation is not just some temporary thing. There's been a history of mental health briefly rising to the top as a priority, but seen being overridden by other priorities. And I can see already at Commonwealth level, there's a concern that while mental health is getting attention, there's aged care, there's defence, there are many other uh, priorities that may supersede mental health. And we also need to ensure that there is a whole of government approach to mental health. All the reports strongly emphasise that fact that mental health is not just a medical problem, not just a health problem, but it involves many other variables. Just to take one example, housing. If people go into hospital and are treated and come out but have nowhere to live, are homeless, or if, as is the case for so many of them, they live in substandard housing which causes stress and tension in their life where they face maybe bullying, uh, tension, drugs around them and so on, then mental health policy will not succeed unless people, certainly at the severe end, have um, stable, secure reasonable housing. That's just one example of many where we look at, need to look at whole of government. And we also need to recognise, as uh, Tim touched on and as Lucy did, we do need system reform. I'm conscious of that because in Victoria, Premier Andrews, in setting up the Royal Commission, said the system is broken. And the fact is that system reform has many dimensions to it. To mention some that were addressed by Victoria's Royal Commission, which did sort of systematic systems analysis review, some of the dimensions are... Uh, dealing with mental health from the point of view of those with mild to moderate to severe forms of mental illness. Or, again, as I think Lucy mentioned, there's the primary system, the GP, the psychologist, the medical. There is the next phase, we could call that community-based mental health, that is out-of-hospital care and treatment for people with pretty serious problems but who won't get into hospital. Uh, you only get into hospital these days if you're quite psychotic. 
there's a huge bit in the middle. Um, then there's also um, the regional, state, regional, local. There's the age thing, child, youth, adult-based. There's regional or geographic maldistribution. There's early intervention and prevention versus treatment. There are questions we've heard about access, navigation, coordination, and numerous other dimensions and links with housing, employment, workplace, education, justice, and so on. So uh, what I believe we have to do is to make it a priority. The biggest priority is, in a word, the missing middle bit, uh, but a comprehensive approach is needed. So that's my opening salvo. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Professor Fells, um, and some uh, different dimensions, but also reinforcing some of Lucy's comments as well. Um, let's <coughs> throw now to Jason, who brings a service delivery frontline perspective to the discussion. Over to you, Jason. Thanks very much, Tim. I too would like to acknowledge country. I'm on the Wurundjeri and Boonwurrung country, people of the Kulin Nation. Pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have joined um, us today in this forum. But I guess the, the past 12 months uh, has created a newfound, um, I'd say, understanding of vulnerability and also empathy towards those experiencing a tough time or those experiencing uh, mental health challenges. And I guess today offers another opportunity for that further reflection. So thank you to Cedar, uh, Tim and Alan, uh, Lucy, and all, all attendees for joining in this discussion today. I guess like many others, we at Headspace, uh, which we focus on the areas of 12 to 25 year olds, um, we, we conducted research last year um, at a time when most of the country was in some form of COVID-19 lockdown. And I guess, look, not surprisingly, we found that 40% uh, of young people felt that the pandemic had impacted their confidence to achieve future goals, found that half of the respondents, uh, that mental health had got worse during um, periods, particularly um, at, during periods of strict lockdown. And whilst we yet haven't captured the impact of COVID-19 in full, we know there will be longer term mental health issues to come. Uh, from it, and there will be long-term support for for young people um, in need, and, and that's obviously critical. And I guess we could speak for all age ranges and that. But I also want to acknowledge those communities who went through the late 2019 and 2020 bushfires, in that the, typically there's a response phase and then there's a recovery. And the recovery phase tends to be when mental health challenges start to emerge and start to be talked about and people started seeking help. But the COVID-19 overlay, if you like, um, has resulted in a delayed, um, I guess, a delayed impact on people seeking the supports um, earlier. So we do, whilst that was, you know, 12 months ago and more, uh, we, we do look to the next 12 months about particularly supporting those communities that have been impacted by bushfires. And you could also argue uh, other communities that have been severely impacted by drought as well. So the COVID impacts, um, what were they and what did young people tell us? Um, certainly was the big words that I picked up during that time, and we're still going through elements of this right now, was around uncertainty, that lack of predictability. Uh, financial security for many people was, it was, was in question. Revisiting goals, the path that I thought I was on may, may have in, indeed changed. Protective factors for good mental health and well-being, such as engaging in healthy activities like, like, like sport or having trusted friendship groups, all of that was a big disruption. Uh, young people reported to us a drastic increase in their inability to carry out daily activities such as what they do at home, work and school. And some things might appear trivial, but they just lost that ability to what was previously quite a simple thing to do became a little bit more difficult and that in itself had an impact on their own well-being. And as I said before, the impacts of bushfire, flood and um, drought are having a major impact on the lives of young people and their ability to function on a day-to-day. -day. So in addition to other um, big, big events, we'll call it, um, there's also a lot um, that is also going on in people's lives uh, prior to a COVID experience. And I just wanted to point this out because there is a direct correlation between a sustained decline in functioning 
and bigger mental health challenges. And I know Alan talks often about uh, functioning as opposed to um, simply coping with the mental distress of a mental health condition. It's actually about to what degree is it holding me back from doing what I love doing and doing that on a regular basis, turning up to work, staying employed uh, and, and, and engaging with family and friends and social activities, all the things that we know that are very good for your, um, your mental health and well-being. So I guess I'll just switch gears a little bit now to talk a little bit about stigma, the help-seeking experience, and why that is even more important as we look to the next 12 months. Stigma around mental health, well, people would say, gee, we're talking about it a lot, so therefore the stigma is less. And sure, it's probably a lot less than generations have gone by, but today 74% of young Australians still say that there is stigma around mental illness, which is why young people um, are so much looking to um, a safe place, a trusted place, in order for them to seek help. So part of the role of what Headspace has been able to achieve with young people, guided by young people, if anything, has been able to promote safety, security, um, a, a youth cafe feel type of environment where you'll be listened to, you'll be uh, listened to be understood and not judged. And on your terms, when you already have the conversations and from there behind the scenes, we talked about that word navigation and and all the, all the bits that may not be connected, we try and present a front face that says, look, you're wel it's welcoming, come in, have a yarn, what's on your mind? It might need one conversation. It's not always mental illness. It might be just experiencing a tough time. Maybe it's validation. I'm looking for something, I'm looking for some reassurance, or indeed maybe Headspace says, look, why don't you, why don't you revisit some things online? Go and have a look at some group chats, some community spaces where other young people who are experiencing similar challenges to you that they've been able to get on top of them um, and you can too. Uh, and with extra support, with that little bit of support, some lifelong, lifelong tips can be provided. I wanted to address the word complexity and that people in crisis or seeking help for mental health issues can often be described as complex. And now being described as complex, um, that may actually add to people's fears that they are too much, they're too complex, they're too much hard work, too difficult, surely no one can help me given everything that's going on in my life. This in turn can exacerbate distress, it can delay um, help seeking efforts, it can result in deterioration or representation to uh, emergency departments in, in states of crisis and subsequently add um, to, the, to the, uh, the impacts on their own mental health and wellbeing. So yes, people can meet all sorts of definitions of being complex. For instance, a combination of factors, um, homelessness or at risk of being homeless, I know Alan touched on that, um, combined with higher levels of psychological distress. By the way, two thirds of young people, one third of young people, sorry, um, reported high to very high levels of psychological distress. That was three times so the rate it was back in 2007, and that statistic itself was conducted in 2018 prior to prior to COVID. So it just gives a bit of an insight. Also, experience of trauma, long-term unemployment, and other comorbidities of which can be physically related as well. There are two other external factors, though, that contribute to the word complex and complexity. The mental health system is complex. The fact that you have to navigate it suggests that it may not be as joined up and connected as one would like. And also, as, as touched on by prior panellists, that the supply of workforce um, is not keeping pace um, with demand for services. We probably have lacked over the last um, generation a workforce plan that has actually delivered a pipeline of um, clinicians and peer workers and others to be uh, ready available for meeting the surge in mental health presentations. But in conclusion, I just wanted to say that no matter the challenges that we face uh, as, as a nation when it comes to the mental health and wellbeing, of, of, of people of all ages, that we have to be hopeful. Um, and in times of uncertainty um, that we're all still navigating, we need hope and optimism as two key ingredients to implement new reforms. Young people taught me that and have not forgotten it. And uh, we need to be able to engage, uh, be hopeful, optimistic, but always grounded by the realities in which people are experiencing in a very diverse setting across Australia. Thanks very much, Tim. Thank you, Jason. Um, across the three of you, you've touched on some common issues around system complexity leading to issues for system navigation for consumers, carers and families. 
Um, you've touched on stigma and um, the unfortunate truth that stigma is still alive and well uh, and can prevent people from seeking help. Um, you've also touched on the missing middle, which hopefully we'll talk a little bit more about uh, in our Q&A session. Who are these missing middle and what is it do they need? Uh, and Jason, you've touched on workforce as well, which um, I think is incredibly important and a factor that is a little bit neglected uh, when we all talk about the need for um, additional services, integration of services, um, services not uh, meeting the demand before them uh, and the need to increase those services, of course, sitting behind all of those things is workforce. So, Jason, thank you for bringing that up as well. I might just kick off uh, and uh, use my prerogative as facilitator to ask the first question. Um, don't forget Pigeonhole, uh, the app, if you can feed your questions through. We have some flowing through now already, uh, so I will turn to those in a second, but first I need to get my, my one off my chest. Um, so here we go. We have the Fifth National Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Plan. We've got various mental health and suicide prevention plans in each jurisdiction. We've got the Productivity Commission inquiry. We've got the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system. And we've got numerous state and territory reviews. Many of the recommendations of these various plans and reviews are unsurprising because they've been recommended before. In fact, you can go back a fair ways and uh, see many times where the same recommendations have come up. Um, the recommendations are vast. Uh, they are at, a whole, are at a whole of system level and can be overwhelming. And we've struggled to implement them in the past. So where should we start? Where do we actually commence our efforts to bring about systemic change to make the system more integrated, to make the services more integrated, to make the levels of government more integrated uh, and to make the challenge of navigation for consumers, carers and families one which they can actually meet in periods of distress. So where do we start? Who would like to fire off first? Do you want me to go first? I'm happy to. <laughs> Away you go, Lucy. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Look, it's a really important, it's the fundamental question, isn't it? Because we do have the reports, the pandemic, as some people call it, that, that is out there. And I think um, if I can refer people to, to go and have a look at, at the report that Christine Morgan submitted to government that's just been released around suicide prevention, I think there's some really good insight there around the starting place. And without wanting to sound too Pollyanna-ish, we can all start. The roadmaps are there, the documents are there, the plans are there. For many of us looking at our own service, whether that's in a workplace or a mental health service or a community group, there are things we can do. And to take that concept of the shared understanding around bringing the lived experiences that we're getting through good co-design, the good evidence-based interventions that our clinicians and academics and lived experience are jointly producing, and the increasing access to data. There should be no, nothing stopping many of us looking at our current offering and thinking about how we can improve it. So I know that does sound trite, but the opportunity is there for all of us to start with this work. And I think you touched on it, Tim, and all the speakers have, to think about our own attitudes. Many people here are not from the mental health sector, but they work in workplaces. And the National Stigma Report Card showed us last year that it their workplace is the, the second highest place where people experience stigma and discrimination when it comes to mental health. So a big change of attitude will change a lot of outcomes, start conversations that may well bring about some great system improvement. And so start small and build up would be my starting place. Thanks. Thank you, Lucy. Um, Alan, your views. Okay. Where should, where should well, we start? Uh, I agree with Lucy. Let me uh, focus on what governments should do, the Commonwealth should uh, adopt the Productivity Commission and the Suicide Prevention recommendations, hopefully at the time of the budget or thereabouts, and 
the Commonwealth needs to have high level, top level support uh, and drive for the reforms from the level of Prime Minister as well as Health Minister. Uh, and it should also have a proper process for working with the states and territories. Already there is some high-level talk between the Prime Minister and some Premiers. We now need to give effect to that at the highest level of the leaders of government as well as at health and mental health minister level. <clears throat> with regard to the states, in the case of Victoria, uh, it has a full blueprint for reform and the government has already announced that it will implement them in full and it has a whole set of processes and machinery for doing that, which I can talk about later if necessary. So it's on the way in Victoria. Now, in regard to the other states, um, I believe myself that they should work through the Victorian report. It needs a bit of adaptation for each state, but basically it gives a framework uh, and proposals for state-based actions. And in saying that the Victorian approach should be adopted, it's not just because maybe the commissioners were enlightened. It's more that the Victorian report, which took two years, had inputs from the lived experience community, from experts, from service providers, from everyone, such that it brings together pretty agreed views across the board on what should be done in detail at state level. So I believe it is a blueprint. Uh, it accompanies um, and is very similar to the PC and indeed suicide prevention report and recommendations. So there are the things to do. And then if you wanted a key variable, we have to work, as I think Tim mentioned, on the workforce bit as something of a priority, but there is a detailed action plan there, right, re ready to go. Thank you, Professor Fells. Um, okay, let's go to the voice of the front line, the coalface. Jason, where should we start in making a difference to people's lives uh, as they're experiencing mental health issues? Well, firstly, the Productivity Commission did outline the problem. They had a go at looking at the solution, but it's the, the blueprint, I think, is definitely in the main what was in the Victorian Royal Commission. It had lived experience. It had frontline people um, heavily invested in, in, in outlining the issues, but also their recommendations that have been heard and have been committed to at a, at a state in Victoria and agreed that the adaptation would need to occur in, in other states and territories. I'll get this, there's a couple of front lines here. One's around families uh, and the support that we need to provide families in, in, in our helping them understand, first of all, what does good mental health and wellbeing look like? What are the protective factors that we need as a family unit to better understand so that we can keep, a, keep an eye out for each other, uh, families and friends, neighbours and others around us? So we've got to think about the village before we talk about the system of care when people are in need of supports, for mental health supports, that is. So there is a lot that we can do as families. And, and as we all know, um, family conflict, domestic violence, family issues are on the rise in this country. And we have to look at why and start to look at how do we address those. So that tends to go down the, the line of outside of the mental health system, actually looking at those social determinants, those, those lead indicators as to what's leading to um, family dysfunctionality, the breakdown of the family unit, and hence the breakdown of, of supports um, for, particularly for our most vulnerable people in Australia. On the front line when it comes to service delivery, 
it's an incredibly unfair environment that we've been set up in, in terms of um, the workforce. We talk about the workforce is just not enough. Sometimes it's not the right skill set. And often, as uh, has been painted out before, there can be a disconnect between primary care and tertiary services. So we know that when, when young people come to see us for support, um, if we can't um, manage what's, what's come through the door in terms of the, the acuity or the, the levels of distress and, and the complexity of the presentation, not of the individual, but the system has actually led to increased complexity. What we need to do is actually work out what's fair, what's appropriate and what's timely care that's required. And what that really is, um, Tim, to cut a long story short, a long-term workforce, a clear vision, a commitment for ongoing reform, not a one-year, two-year project, a long-term commitment um, to address the better connection between primary care uh, and, and, and specialist care, and of course, not underestimating the importance of the family unit and how that can play a role in helping so many um, people prior to um, any mental illness or mental health conditions emerging. Thank you, Jason. Um, emphasis on workforce again at the coal phase, uh, and it's coming up through uh, pigeonhole as one of the major issues that people are interested in. So let's stay with workforce for the moment. Um, how do we ensure that Australia has the mental health workforce that it needs? And particularly when it comes to community support workers, uh, social support workers and uh, uh, the importance of peer workers in particular, how do we ensure that we've got the workforce we need to address, for example, the newly discovered missing middle? Uh, I might start, Jason, with you, and then we'll, we'll build up to a uh, whole of system view from Lucy. Yeah, look, look, Tim, it's an overwhelming thought around the what's needed uh, in, in reality. It's actually, when you look at the prediction of what's to come, what's here now actually and what's to come, yeah, look, if you think about physical health and outpatient clinics and emergency departments, we've been counting for a very long time about how many people are waiting, how long have they been waiting, um, what their level of acuity is, what their category is, and systematically over time trying to reduce those waiting times and, and so forth. When it comes to mental health, there is a lot of unmet need. It doesn't mean they're in the missing middle. It just means that, you know what, I might talk about mental health, but I don't really want to go and seek help because there's shame associated with it. There's stigma associated with it. So there is an incredible amount of work that can be done prior to uh, the mental health system actually getting involved, so to speak. But what, what's needed from a workforce point of view is to look at every step of the continuum of someone's journey from, from that really earliest intervention at a, at a, at a, from, from childhood right through to the, um, to the aged. And that would be to making sure that we've got a, a culture of care. And I emphasize the word culture. It can't be just plotting more people in, co-locating them and hoping they will get on well. A designed service model that actually gives vibrancy and people want to come to work, they're really proud to. They've got good systems, good data, good IT, good buildings. Um, and also highly integrated with all the online digital innovation that's occurring across this country. So we need a digital workforce. We need a, a, a team-based in-centre, in-community in workforce working together at all stages of the continuum. We really do need that longer-term workforce vision, which I'm, I'm sure and I'm hopeful um, of announcements off the back of Royal Commissions and Productivity Commissions into mental health, as you outlined earlier. Thank you, Jason. Uh, let's go to whole of system view then from Lucy. Um, Tim, look, workforce is probably number one issue in a lot of respects, and it's a real challenge for us. Early data produced a few years ago said we've probably got a 15-year lag on the workforce, which means that we need to, to really amp this up. Commonwealth Department of Health is working on the National Mental Health Workforce Strategy that's due out later this year, and that does take into the, the remit peer workers right through to, to clinicians, et cetera. But it's so much more than that, and I think Jason touched on it. If we want people to do a good job, we need to give them a good job to do. And so there's elements of that, that job and work design in our services that needs to be really improved. And I think um, we can look to colleagues doing some really innovative work in the UK around that, um, which is creating a culture of good work in our mental health systems and services, but it's also looking at ways we can rapidly build the capacity of our workforce. How do we find ways to make 
allow people to work at the top of their scope of training and, and bring in other elements to the workforce as well. It, this takes some creative thinking in that space, and I think that that's really important. But it's also for our professional colleagues, uh, colleges and, and organisations to start thinking a bit creatively about their own curricula and training. We still don't have an integrated um, digital into the pre-service training for our psychologists and our psychiatrists and our social workers, yet we're saying it's, it's really the third leg of the stool for a lot of the work that we're doing. So we need to step back and look at the training that we're delivering for people and actually teach people how to collaborate in their professional work and share that load and understanding. Well, just to add a little bit, because I agree with what's just been said by uh, Jess and, and by Lucy, Yes, it is a comprehensive challenge. In the case of the Royal Commission, it actually uh, set out a very comprehensive strategy for addressing the problem. And in a sense, that statement just indicates the breadth, depth, width of the problem. Uh, just the two or three specific things. Uh, there's now recognition of the value of peer work groups, um, they understand the problems of people with lived experience really well, can engage with, sympathise with them, and it needs a big push in terms of making training available, giving resource support and so on. Um, I also just wanted to mention the geographic maldistribution of much of the workforce, and I particularly, uh, I mean, that's um, where I live in Melbourne. Uh, if I have a headache and walk out the front door, I can be have five psychiatrists, 50 psychologists come to my help. If I live in a poor area, not much is available. In rural and regional Australia, serious shortages I'd just like to identify one of the drivers of that, and that's the Medicare payment system under which someone is qualified to be a psychologist, psychiatrist, etc. They collect their provider number and then they can live wherever they want and they tend to live in better off areas. So there is, that's an underlying cause of the geographic maldistribution of the workforce. Thank you, Alan. And we might stick with you for the moment um, and go to one of the questions that comes has come through from Pigeonhole and has uh, uh, fairly high votes against it. And the question is, how do we rebalance the investment in mental health to increase the emphasis on prevention and early in intervention and adding my bit to it and focus on keeping people well in the community instead of waiting for the crisis? Well, um, I think it just requires additional resources because redistribution within this financial status quo is not impossible, but it's difficult and slow. And the fact is, unfortunately, that the needs in every part of the system are considerable. That's why when the Royal Commission was set up, it decided that even though it had already decided that the missing middle was the big problem, it actually needed to recommend more hospital beds as a priority. So I think it must be... Uh, additional resourcing. And there is a lot of growth money going into health anyway. I mean, every year there is additional money going into health and mental health, and that's where you need to tackle it. You may recall the National Mental Health Commission um, in about 2015 recommended that a tiny bit of the growth funding should be allocated to prevention and early intervention. That was promptly stopped by the health ministers and with a lot of support, unfortunately, from within 
the practitioners of mental health for that uh, to block that recommendation. Thank you, Alan. Um, Lucy, your comment on how do we shift to earlier intervention and prevention? Look, I think, Tim, it's a really important question. And if we go back again to the, the, the work of the economists and the central agencies in this space, we know that our best buys in mental health, using the economic language, are around um, reducing adverse childhood experiences and improving, improving parenting skills. And yet they're often bits that are, are left out and they're not core health issues. And I think this becomes the challenge. We need to, to get better at looking at the social determinants, which if we've got time, we, we might come to. But it's a big focus in the National Children's Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy to say, for our young ones, let's get that trajectory right, whether you're a first 1,000 days or a first 3,000 days, getting our kids onto that positive trajectory, supporting them in their communities, in their families, whatever that makeup looks like, can really shift the curve on a lot of these issues. But they're not health minister issues. They're for other elements of government. And so this takes advocacy from all of us and an element of education and communication to support that. But both... Victorian Royal Commission and the Productivity Commission highlighted this issue of that need to, to get in early and reset trajectories. Thank you, Lucy. Um, we might just stay with uh, the issue of social determinants. Many of the factors that you've all mentioned that impact people's mental health and wellbeing are factors that lay outside the scope of influence of the mental health system. Um, housing, education, racism, discrimination, parenting. How do we get those who have responsibility and influence over those social determinants to use their levers to strengthen the protective factors for mental health and wellbeing and to address the deficits in social determinants that impact mental illness and recovery? Um, a big question. Uh, but let's go to Lucy first. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. And look, again, I'm, I, I want to point to the, the advice provided to the Prime Minister around suicide prevention on this one, because some of the recommendations there I think are a great model for both the suicide prevention system and the mental health system. And one of the key recommendations there is that this is a first minister's issue. And I think that that's quite key in getting good policy outcomes. If First Ministers, whether that's our Premiers or our Prime Minister, take ownership of this and set the targets across all the portfolios of government and there is responsibility sitting, whether it's in a Transport Minister's portfolio or an Education Minister's portfolio, to think about the wellbeing and the suicide prevention at that, that extreme end, but of the wellbeing of the population and how their policies and their strategies and their service design can have either a, a positive, a neutral or a negative impact on people. Um, let me, uh, first of all, I agree totally with what Lucy said. So I'll just add a point, and that is that the Victorian Royal Commission proposed, it's been accepted, specific government machinery involving leadership from the top. There's to be a special cabinet committee just on mental health, led by the Premier and by designated senior ministers. And also the Deputy Premier has been made Minister for Mental Health. And there's also a Secretaries Committee just on mental health. And there's also a commission, an independent mental health and wellbeing commission, to report on the performance across the whole of government in relation to recommendations of the Commission. So if you look at that report, there's quite a lot of machinery and proposals to enable a whole of government approach to be taken. But it does require quite a lot of education of the other departments, housing, education, employment and so on about the specifics of mental health and how to incorporate them into what they do. Thank you, Alan. And Jason, just to you for 60 second response, given you see this at the coalface and the, the holistic nature of people's needs, 
how do how do we get the system to respond to the whole person, not just the mental health person? We're talking in a lot of high level stuff here, aren't we? We're talking about government policy reports, um, new bodies, frameworks, first ministers, all very important on the ground in communities. They're actually doing this. Um, I'm amazed everywhere I go across the country, um, key community groups um, getting together to work on what it is they can do with their own resources and their own innovation and creativity, supported by frameworks, supported by strong guidance and, and evidence, important evidence, and that they do get on with it. Now, often what happens, though, is they discover that hey, in a town of 200,000 people, we've got 4,000 people who, are, um, who don't have a home. Um, so we can count. We know who they are. We know what we need to do, and that needs to then be fed into other parts of government to actually help fund a, a, a social housing, affordable accommodation, uh, as an example. But the innovation and creativity is on the ground. Um, it's The magic happens in local communities, not in the reports. Uh, but what local communities do need is that ongoing support to, to, to address the issues as they emerge and ideally predict what's coming and get ahead of the curve. Excellent. Thank you, Jason. Um, and thank you all for your comments and responses to those questions, pretty curly questions. And I think we could um, very productively be here for a number of hours trying to make progress towards something that we are all very committed to. So thank you very much for your time commitment today and for your thoughts. Um, uh, just summarising those very quickly, uh, advice from Professor Fells is let's follow the Productivity Commission report and the Vic Royal Commission report. Um, some on the ground advice from Jason, uh, look at the village and work on a culture of, of care across the world. Uh, workforce issues raised uh, as a significant concern going forward and I would echo that. Um, and also strong message around social determinants and this is a First Minister's issue, it is not a health minister or, or mental health minister, minister alone issue. Um, and lastly, uh, stigma, sadly, is alive and well. Um, but we can all do something about it. We can all do something about all of these issues by continuing the conversation around uh, the road ahead in terms of our mental health system and support systems. Uh, so I'd encourage all of you to continue that conversation back at your workplaces uh, and let's let's keep chipping away. This is a long-term task. So thank you all, and I will hand back to Joe. Thanks, Tim, and thank you, everyone, and in particular, thank you to our participants, uh, Lucy Brogdon, Alan Fells, and Jason Trithowen, for sharing your insights and expertise on this really important topic. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank particularly um, NAUS Group and Tim. Uh, your ongoing support allows CETA to continue to lead the discussion on, on key policy issues like this very important topic that we've discussed today. Uh, you can continue adding your questions to Pigeonhole for the next 15 minutes or so, and CETA will post selected post-event email, uh, which will also include a link to the recording of today's discussion. Um, so please do uh, make sure that you get those final questions in. Finally, I'd like to thank the audience for your time and participation in the discussion and remind everyone that the discussion has been recorded and will soon be available on the CEDA website to re-watch and share with your colleagues and network. Uh, please do keep up to date on CEDA's program by visiting our website. Um, we have some fantastic events coming up, including um, uh, a fantastic event on the 6th of May on Australia's Aged Care Workforce Post-Royal Commission uh, and also on the 4th of June, uh, a great topic around building resilient Australian cities. Um, and please continue the conversation by connecting with CEDA on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and Facebook. Thank you again, everybody, uh, for the terrific discussion today and enjoy the rest of your day.